All right. Those of you tuning in, we are going to get started in a little bit. Going to wait till two o'clock so that we don't miss anyone. But right now, you guys can check out our virtual site. That's going to have anything um, virtual that we've done so far. And for today's lesson, you can get the Seagrass worksheet. Hi, Anne. Can you hear me? Hi, Moritz. Thanks for joining. All right, getting started. So today's topic is in classes that we teach at Marine Lab, and it's really one of my favorite classes to teach. Um, a lot of people come down to the Florida Keys looking for the cool reef, which is really awesome habitat too, we talked about it last week, but the sea grasses really have um, some special components to them, and they're very important to the environment down here talk about all of that throughout our lesson. So if you guys are tuned in, throw me a comment so that I can see that you are here um, learning with us. Say hi. Let me know that you're listening so I can see who is here. Um, if you're wondering who I am, <laughs> I'm Rachel. I've been working at Marine Lab for about three and a half years. Years now. This is a picture of me on one of our boats, one of our um, boats that we charter out, doing a seagrass critter talk. Um, it's pretty exciting time out there in the seagrass beds. Um, Anne is telling me that the audio is a little bit off, so if you guys are having trouble hearing me, just let me know. I'll try to talk a little bit louder. Oh, there's an echo. Hmm, I wonder why that is. I'm not sure. I don't know why that is. It might be the room that I'm in. Um, but this is the room where I get the best Wi-Fi. So if the audio is really, really bad, just let me know. But if it's okay, we're gonna keep going. Hi, Finley. Thanks for tuning in again. Uh, I was going to use a headset, but I don't have one that's compatible with the, the laptop that I'm using. So let's figure that out for next time. Good. Glad it's better. Okay. We're going to get started. All right. So we have our seagrasses all over down here. They're a very, very large seagrass bed. Um, the largest continuous seagrass bed in the world. It's pretty amazing. You can see the green blob on your screen. That is where our seagrasses are. Let me have. Uh, let me explain the area around where we are. So we are in Key Largo in the Florida Keys. If you can see my arrow, let's see if this works. Oh, I don't know if it's gonna work. So Key Largo is one of the first keys that it's the first key that you enter when you get to the Florida Keys. 
um, between the edge of South Florida and that strip of the Florida Keys is Florida Bay. So that small body of water there. And then out to our west, to the left of the big chunk of Florida, that is the Gulf of Mexico, which a lot of you are probably familiar with. And then out to our east is the Atlantic Ocean. So our seagrasses span on both sides of the Keys um, and definitely in our Florida Bay. That's where we have lots of seagrasses. Now, tell me, you guys, put it in the comments. Why do you think that location where the green shaded region is, why do you think that's where we see seagrasses? What about the environment? allows seagrass to grow. Now there's a little bit of a delay, so I'm going to give you guys a few seconds to think about that and put in the comments why you think you see seagrass there. Tell me why you think you see seagrass in this shaded green region. All right, Finley, I like it. Salt water and nutrients. Yeah, seagrass needs salt water, definitely, and lots of nutrients. We have a lot of that in Florida today. And very good, a lot of you guys are getting it. The water is shallower, says Shannon. Marites, enough sunlight and nutrients, good. Chrissy, good job. All right, you guys are getting it. So our environment there is conducive to a seagrass growth. And when we talk about ecology, which is a big theme that we have at Marine Lab, we're talking about how the environment um, interacts with the community. So the environment being non-living things and the community being living things. So ecology is the interactions between the non-living and the living things in that habitat. Very good, everyone. Okay. Moving on. Now, if we were to find a helicopter above Florida Bay, this is kind of the view that we would see. And inside the water where our seagrasses live, there are lots of things that allow seagrasses to grow very well. Now, seagrasses are a plant. So you guys tell me what do plants, specifically seagrasses, need in order to grow? So what are the environmental conditions that it needs for, that seagrass needs? It is a plant, so think about those things that you've learned in science class that plants need. Let me know in the comments what you think. What do seagrasses need to grow? What is in these waters? All right, Dylan, warm water, applicable nutrients. Definitely need nutrients. The water down here is warmer than the rest of the country. So um, you'd be surprised there is a pretty big temperature range, though. It goes from um, 65 sometimes at the lowest to 90 at the highest, but warmer water than most of the country. Sunlight, good job, Shannon. Jenny, good. Finley, good job. Sunlight, nutrients, water, carbon dioxide. Very good, you guys. So definitely sunlight. And since the water down in Florida Bay is on an average of five feet, it's going to get lots of sunlight. And we have many sunny days down here. Nutrients, lots and lots of nutrients. And water, specifically 
what type of water you guys. I'm just going to tell you salt water. Sea grasses need salt water in order to survive. They are a salt water plant. Now, Florida Bay is an estuary, so that means there's salt water and fresh water. But because there's salt water, it's good to go. It also needs sediment to live in, to put its roots in and hang out and grow. And carbon dioxide. There we go. All right. The sea grasses that we have down here, we have three common species. We have turtle grass, which we see a lot of. Good. Nadia, salt. You said we need salt water. Good job. Our turtle grasses are very, very common around here. They are wide blades and they have a round tip like a turtle flipper. So that's kind of how you can remember turtle grass. They're pretty wide and we see them a lot. All right, now we have manatee grass. Manatee grass is round like a manatee. If you were to ID it, you could roll it between your fingertips and it would roll like a pencil. And the way that we remember is because it's round like a manatee. We see this a lot more on the ocean side in mixed beds out there near the reef. Our third species is shoal grass. Shoal grass is special. It's a grass that can grow in disturbed areas or new seagrass beds. So it can, it's tough grow in those areas that may have been damaged or just in a new area where seagrass isn't growing yet. And we also kind of nickname it the pioneering seagrass because pioneers settle in new areas. So that's where you get that little nickname. Okay. So Another way to kind of differentiate our species of seagrass, turtle grass is much wider than shoal grass. Shoal grass is pretty thin. It is flat like turtle grass, much, much thinner, and the top of it is also flat, like someone cut the top of the shoal grass blade with the scissors. So the difference there is the top being round versus flat. All right, out in our seagrass beds, we have lots and lots of seagrasses, which are true plants. They have true roots that are absorbing nutrients through those roots. Um, and then you have algae mixed in the seagrasses. Algae are non-vascular. They do not have that transportation system that seagrasses have that keep nutrients and water throughout the plant. They also do not have true roots. Algae, you can see the picture on the right, algae has what's called a hold fast. And those look like roots, but all they really do is anchor in that algae. They're holding it um, down in the sediment. And algae is able to get their nutrients through their semi-permeable membrane. They can pull that nutrients and water out from the area around them. And they have some pretty unique structures and shapes, so let's talk about those. There's kind of two types we're going to talk about. Calcareous algae is one. They're kind of my favorite because they're special. They have this limestone inside of them. They're able to create limestone inside of their bodies, and that basically means they have rock inside their structure, so they're really tough um, and hard like rock. And so that helps them kind of stay sturdy in the water column. Maurice, you're asking, does that make kelp an algae? You are correct. Kelp is an algae. Good job. We don't have any kelp down here in the Florida Keys, but off the coast of California, I know there's some great kelp forests that I would love, 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 love to go snorkeling or diving in. I've heard it's pretty cool. So calcareous algae are here. We've got some different species here. Something that's really beneficial about calcareous algae that have limestone inside of them is that they deter predators. So they're harder. They're not as yummy and delicious or easy to eat. 
So they have a little bit less predation than the other algae we're going to talk about. And our most favorite algae, or my most favorite algae, and usually the student's most favorite algae is the mermaid's teacup, which is pictured here. And it kind of has a little suction cup top to it. And the students have to stick it to their noses. And it's a really cool algae because it's single celled. Hold it in your hand, you're holding one cell in your hand. So it's unicellular, which is pretty unique to um, hold such a large organism that's one cell. I know that the audio is a little bit bad. Um, I, I'm trying to speak as loud as possible. I don't know what's going on, but uh, we'll try to fix that in the future. Sorry about that, Kathleen. Okay, so. Is our non calcareous algae. These guys do not have limestone in them. And they have a runner that kind of connects their um, algae blades together. And um, some unique algaes out there. Tater top, feathery fern. Those guys are pretty common. Alright, so all this talk about seagrasses. Why do we care so much about our seagrasses? What are some things that are important to us about seagrasses and to the environment? Why do we love our seagrasses? Put it in the comments, everyone. Can Write it on your worksheet too. What are some things that are good about seagrasses? I think I have a question, a full question for you guys. We'll do that. What do you guys think? Can you see the poll question? Yes, Finley, a floaty potato. <laughs> we love our manatees down here. Good, seagrass is our food source. Good, Shannon. There's lots and lots of importances, and you guys are getting it. Good job in the pool. All of you guys are saying all of the above. We're going to talk about a lot of these importances in the coming slides, so here we go. All right, first, we, to start it off, we have a challenge for you. Now, if you have the worksheet, this picture is on your worksheet, and there's creatures hiding themselves in the seagrass. Believe it or not, in the seagrasses. So if you're looking at this picture and you're thinking, wow, I don't see anything, then definitely that's because these animals are masters of the grass. So look really closely. See what you can find. I'll point them out to you in a little bit, but I want to give you guys some time. In the meantime, we'll show show some results of what everyone thought for why seagrasses are important. Good, Chrissy, I see your response. Removing excess nutrients, that's a really good one. Stabilize substrate, forage, shelter for larval fish, very good. We'll talk about all those things. What do you see in the second picture? Oh, Nadia found the urchin. Very good, Nadia. That was a tough one. You guys, when I first saw this picture, our instructor, Tara, created it. And man, I couldn't see a thing. I couldn't find anything. So it's tough. All right. Let's give you, oh, good job, Shannon, a snail in the lower left corner. Good job, Jenny, urchins. Okay, so let's show... 
the answers. Where are those sneaky little critters? Voila! So the red circles are pointing out our critters. Now, believe it or not, there was a seahorse in there. And man, are those seahorses very, very hard to find. It's always our instructors at Marine Lab School to find a seahorse while we're out there snorkeling. And it really doesn't happen that often. Those seahorses are very, very hard to find. But you got a lot of other animals hanging out on the blades of the seagrass. And if you notice, a lot of them are clinging to the surface of the seagrass. So let's talk about that. Seagrasses serve as a really great substrate or surface for things to live and grow on. So right now we have this scal up here stuck to the side of the seagrass. He's hanging out at the top of the water, filter feeding. He loves that fresh um, current bringing lots and lots of salt water his way up high on that seagrass blade. So it's really important um, for a lot of those creatures that cling to the seagrasses as a substrate. And then if you look really close at a seagrass blade, you're going to see a ton of stuff. There's so many things that live on a seagrass blade and use it as a substrate. We call those epiphytes and epifauna, things that grow on the surface of a plant. And you can see all the little things, um, little phytoplankton, little nematodes, crazy amounts of things that you just won't see with your eyes out there. So substrate, an important part of seagrasses. All right, now we're looking at this picture here. And you got to look at it from the view of a small fish because that's going to tell you um, how great of a shelter these seagrass beds are. They really look like, and it looks like an underwater forest from this view. And I always compare it to, honey, I shrunk the kids. When those kids are walking around in the grass outside their house, the grass looks 10 feet tall, and they can hide pretty well in it. All right. Shelter. Challenge number two. So now we're going to do some challenges where we show you a picture, and we want you to caption it. So write down something that describes what's going on in the picture. And this one's just for fun. What do you think is happening? Where do you think these people are? What are they doing? Put it in the comments, you guys. What are these people doing? Yeah, where do you how many seahorses do you have in? Notice, I'm with you. There's probably so many seahorses I have not seen. They're just too good, those seahorses. That's their best defense. All right, back to what's going on in this picture. What do we think? What's happening? Very quick. Yeah, Shannon, ready to snorkel and go. They're just ready to pop off the boat into the water. They spit in their mask, they put them on their head, they sat at the edge of the boat, and then they just scoot off the boat. Good job. All right, now our seagrass, our first seagrass caption challenge. Look at these pictures. Look at them from left to right or right to left. What's happening in this series of photos? You notice change in the water, you notice the amount of algae changing. What's happening? Remember, we're kind of on the theme of why seagrasses are important. So you can maybe think about some of the things we've already discussed as far as why seagrasses are important. Okay, Shannon says pollution or no more sun. Good. So something is changing in the environment, causing less seagrasses. Okay, Dylan says pioneer species are growing. Good, so they're inhabiting a new area. Okay, the water is being polluted. There's something changing in the water. Life cycle seagrass, seagrass is growing, good. And the reason it's growing, if you're looking at it from right to left, is because maybe the environment is improving. 
Good, Maurice. The diagram shows how dirty water affects seagrass. So the darker water um, is more nutrients, maybe more turbidity, more sediment in the water. Seagrasses don't do well um, with not so great water quality. So they're going to grow better in an area that has better water quality. Let's talk about that. Good job, Finley. So this picture really tells um, as we look at this picture, the island in the middle separates the ocean side from the bay side, and that refers to the Atlantic Ocean being at the top of the screen and the bay side before the bay being at the bottom of the screen. And you can see the difference in the color of the water. And seagrasses are so, so good at absorbing nutrients and stabilizing sun. Now, those two things are great for water quality, especially when it comes to the coral reef. Our seagrasses play a very important role in um, taking excess nutrients out of the water so that our corals don't have to deal with an excess of algae overgrowing because of too much nutrients. And then seagrasses are able to hold that sediment in next to their roots and hug it in so that it's not causing too much turbidity or too much sediment floating around the water column. Pretty cool picture, huh, you guys? You can see how bright blue the water gets next to the reef. It's one of the most amazing sights when you get out to the reef. Uh, cap cap caption challenge. What do you think is happening in this picture? So if you have your worksheet, I have all the captions on there. You can caption it on your worksheet. You can tell me in the comments what you think this picture is telling you. What is going on? Notice the size of the fish, how it changes from when it goes from one habitat to the next. Good, Shannon, a life cycle. The fish is life cycle. Good, Dylan, a life cycle of shallow water. So, when you get to the seagrass beds, the size of the fish is a little bit different, so you can notice that. The reef is a little bit towards the right. Good, everyone's getting it. It's a circle of life, as Finley says. The life cycle, very good. So, what's happening is our seagrass beds serve as a really great nursery for our juvenile fish to live in. Then, once they uh, grow up a little bit bigger, then get themselves back out to the coral reef. Um, so our seagrasses and our coral reefs are very well connected in that way. Here's some juvenile fish that will um, grow up in the seagrass beds and some fish stay in the seagrass beds for their whole life if they're a little bit too small to be out of the reef. So lots of diversity out there. Captain Challenge. For all of you guys who paid attention in science class, this one should be an easy one for you. What is happening? What process is being depicted in this video? In this picture, sorry. Very, very important process. It's one of the reasons we all can breathe. <laughs> What do we think? What's the word I'm looking for? Sarah says, plant doing its job. Yes, it is doing its job, and it does it for free all day long. All right. Oxygen production and carbon storage. So plants are producing oxygen to get that from photosynthesis. Carbon storage. Now that is a really one, especially now, our higher levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, causing some climate change. You guys have all, I'm sure, heard about that. Good job, Shannon, photosynthesis. So, our seagrasses do a very good job of creating what's called a carbon sink. They're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, they use it for photosynthesis, and they also keep taking it out and store it in the sediment below them. So, 
they create this carbon storage below them, which is important to combat climate change. All right, here's a caption for fun. What's going on? What are these large, mysterious creatures? What are they doing? I know what I would put as a caption, but I want to see what you guys think. What are these? Some of my favorites. Sarah, friendly manatees. They are so friendly. We love them. Everyone on Marine Lab gets excited when there's a manatee visiting. Even the instructors, we never ever get tired of seeing these manatees. I think they're giving each other a high five for being so great. Hello, friend. <laughs> yeah, Michelle, high five. Very good. Loady potatoes. <laughs> awesome. Okay, you guys. So, we talked about a lot of important things for our sea grasses. Here's just a little bit of a review if you want to fill out that worksheet. Maybe you missed a few. But we've got our habitat being a very important benefit of our seagrasses. There's a few things that come along with that. They are a good substrate. They are eaten for food. And they're shelter. Water quality, that sediment being stabilized, nutrients being absorbed, good for water quality. Connected. Their connections to the other ecosystems around them are um, extremely important to create a successful, healthy ecosystem nursery, um, water quality for the coral reef, and providing oxygen and getting rid of some of that carbon we have out there. Good. I'm still seeing your comments for the manatee caption. So tell me, guys. All right, so now we have to talk about something that maybe isn't so happy, but it is happening. I want you guys to understand what's happening out there in our seagrass beds. They are threatened by some things, just like a lot of our marine environments and a lot of our environments around the world. Some climate threats are physical damage and poor water quality. Let's talk about the physical. So props to our physical. And as you guessed, they are from us humans. Unfortunately, we either purposely or are making crop scouts out there. The Florida Bay seagrass bed is not too deep, so we can accidentally hit with our boat crops, and that's destroying um, the seagrass below, which is sad. And there are fines for that if you get caught. And it does happen. Accidents happen. Something we can do about it. These funny little birds are called double crested cormorants, and they're actually providing fertilizer for our seagrass bed below. Now, these beds below are damaged, and they probably had a uh, species of seagrass planted below them. I want you guys to tell me what species of seagrass do you think they would plant in a disturbed seagrass area, an area where seagrass has been damaged? What species of seagrass do you think? The species that does the best in damaged or new areas. Hi, Silas. Thanks for joining us. You're in the right place if you don't know a lot about green science or teaching you about seagrass right now. Stay tuned. Shannon got it. Nice. Shoal grass is our grass. That's pioneering, so it does well in damage your new areas. So these double crested cormorants. Good job, Finley, Nadia. These double crested cormorants, they're diving birds. They spend a lot of their time swimming and diving, looking for food. They get tired, so they want somewhere to rest and dry off. As they digest and dry off, they kind of do something important. They poop. They poop on shoal grass. 
bloom so that our seagrass bed can grow faster. This um, excrement is a fertilizer for our seagrasses to grow a little bit faster. So who knew how important a PVC pipe with a wood block on top would be for our seagrasses? But it's a very simple solution to some damaged seagrasses. All right, now let's talk about water quality. Poor water quality. What's up with that? So in Florida, you guys, if you live here, you're probably pretty familiar with this water quality change over the years. Before uh, population increased dramatically in Florida, you have the picture on the left depicting tons of water flowing through South Florida in through the Everglades and uh, emptying into Florida Bay. That is the natural, historical, natural water flow. To the right is how the natural water flow has changed in Florida since an increase in population. So we've got less fresh water flowing into Florida Bay. And since it has not gone through the Everglades um, and the wetlands for as long, it hasn't been able to get as much nutrients filtered out. If you're at all familiar with Everglades or if you're not, they're referred to as the river of, of grass. So it's a big wetland with long grass. And historically, this fresh water flowed through winding streams and as a sheet across this river of grass and they were able to the everglades were able to filter out a lot of this nutrients so now because it's um less water flowing through the everglades you got more nutrients going out the sides of florida and you have fresh water kind of flowing out the sides of florida and less fresh water coming down here to the florida bay so you have a higher salinity because of that and you have a higher amount of nutrients so that's affecting our water quality. Okay, part two, fun part, you guys. You stay tuned until now. You get to see all the animals that live in our seagrass beds. But first I want to talk about this term, taxonomy. You may have heard it in your science classes. This little diagram might help you understand it a little bit. Now you have this classification system that organizes animals into these groups because of characteristics that they have. So we're going to talk specifically a lot about bipod. And that one is pretty general. There's going to be different animals inside that pylon, but they all have similar features or characteristics. So let's go to the first one. You have your worksheet. You can and there you have a little chart with all the animals and what file they belong to. This first one is a little bit of a challenge, and I have some more for you, but first, let's give you some hints. First file, periphera. These guys are animals. They have pores, and those pores are little openings that allow water to go in and out, so they're filter feeders, and they don't have definite symmetry. So... They just kind of grow in all different ways and directions. And I want to ask you guys, here's a picture of them. What animal do you think I'm talking about? I'm going to get you a little poll so you can let me know what you think. What animal is in Phylum Periphera? What animal is in the picture? Show. What do you think? Got some options for you in this pool here. Ah, we have one correct answer so far. What else can we get? Ah, a lot of you guys are getting it right. Good job. Good, good, good. I didn't trick anyone with my little actions. You guys are too smart. All right, I'm going to show the results. Bing, bing, bing. It's a sponge. Good job, you guys. So you got two 
different species of sponges here. Chicken liver on the left, loggerhead on the right. Chicken liver is so fun to hold because it literally feels like what you could imagine a chicken liver feels like. It's slimy and squishy. But chicken liver is everywhere. It grows on the mangrove roots. It grows on sea grasses. Loggerhead sponges are awesome too. They kind of um, are really good habitat inside for worms and crabs and shrimps and all sorts of different things live inside sponges. And they're a really cool animal. They're pretty important for the water quality, doing that filter feeding that they do all the time. I have a video for you guys showing just how much water these sponges are filtering. So hopefully you can see this video, all right. The diver is putting this fluorescent dye in. Don't worry, it's not harmful, but this dye is going to show you how much water is coming out of that sponge and being absorbed by the sponge. And as it goes through the sponge, it's being filtered. That water is coming out a little bit better than it was before. So they're able to filter out bacteria and nutrients. Look at all that water being filtered. That barrel sponge is doing a great job of improving the water quality at the coral reef. Sponges are everywhere, though. They're improving the water quality in seagrass beds, by the mangroves, the coral reef, and in between and all around. We love our sponges. All right. Next phylum, Cnidaria. Now, this one has a pretty popular animal in it that a lot of people know about because it has stinging cells. And it also has tentacles. It also has two eyes, which is either alcohol, which is sessile, it doesn't move, or medusa, moves around. So let's see what we got. You guys can give me a little guess in the comments what animal belongs to fibromyalgia that has stinging cells. Dun, dun, dun. What is this animal? Looks kind of weird, but it definitely has a Medusa body shape, tentacles. Can't see the stinging cells, or fancy term, nidocytes, but they actually are secreted through the mucus that comes out of the sky. You probably guessed it. It's a jellyfish. Good job, Maurice. Good job, Nadia. So, this is a weird guy. This is an upside down jellyfish here in the Florida Keys. It's a very popular jellyfish. They sit upside down because they have a uh, symbiotic algae inside of them that needs sunlight. So, because they're tentacles, they need to show their tentacles to the sun in order for that algae to perform photosynthesis. Good job, Finley. You got Cassiopeia. Good job. So, these guys have all the characteristics that put them in Phyronidaria, along with your coral. Good job, Nadia. Good job, Sarah. Got coral. And anemones also have stinging cells and tentacles. And they have that good polyp body shape, those anemones. Moving on, we've got some annelids. Phylum annelida. These guys have segmented bodies. They're bilaterally symmetrical. So basically, just like humans, they're equal on two sides. And here are some examples. Now, looking at these pictures, you might not be able to tell what they are, but I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give you a couple seconds to maybe decide what you think these animals are. You can put it in the comments. It's pretty mysterious. And some people don't even think these exist in the ocean. Some students have told me that. But they're worms. Worm, worm, worm. The top one is feathered as a worm, and the bottom one is a spaghetti worm. And what you're actually seeing is the mouth parts reaching out for food. So the feathered as a worm, what has like a feather like appendage coming out. 
those guys are really needing for the worm that's tucked inside a little tube below them. And then the same with the spaghetti worm. Those little appendages are coming out looking for food, breathing, while the body is safe and tucked in the segment. Pretty neat, worms. Here's a little video. We'll kind of skip along so you can see this worm come out. Bam. This guy's out on the reef, got a shrimp next to him. He is kind of getting too close to that worm, and you're going to see this worm be able to retract its um, feathers or mouth parts like that really fast when it senses motion or light changes. And then they can come back out when they feel that it's safe. That is also coming from a worm. This is a mucus ball that is secreted from the mouth of a worm. As you guys know, mucus, like snot, is sticky, so it collects a lot of things in the water column, so it's able to collect food for the worm. The worm then sucks in that mucus ball through its mouth, absorbs all that awesome nutrients and whatever else was collected on that mucus ball, and then it secretes a new mucus ball to collect more food. The life of a worm. Next phylum, pretty neat, phylum mollusca. These guys have soft, squishy bodies, and a lot of them produce shells. So, what do you think? What animals are we talking about now? All of these guys. So, snails, sea slugs, scallops. Our clean conchs are pretty popular down here, um, although they were over harvest very, very much so. They are prohibited for any kind of collection down here, so they're very protected. We do see them occasionally at a few reefs, um, so they're fun to see. They have a bright pink inside of their shell. Our lettuce sea slugs are our famous marine lab critter that we see in the mangroves, and our blue eyed scallops. All really cool mollusks. Here's a video of a tulip snail. They're pretty common sight. They have, this is their muscular foot reaching out, and then that hard plate at the end is the operculum. You'll see it tucked its muscular foot in and then turns around on its big muscular foot. Tulip snails have like a galaxy like look to them on their muscular foot. It's a really neat sight. They're really bright. Arthropoda. Here's our next phylum. These guys' characteristics, jointed appendages. So arms and legs that can bend. An exoskeleton, so a hard outer skeleton. And compound eyes. All of these things make up the animals found in arthropoda. So crabs, lobsters, shrimp, all things like that. And the cool thing about these guys is that they can molt. So this is a video of a horseshoe crab molting. They're shedding their exoskeleton because they need to be able to grow larger. So they get rid of that small, tight exoskeleton, and then they start to create a bigger exoskeleton on the outside of their body so that they can keep on growing. I'm going to skip a little bit to the end. That horseshoe crab kind of wiggles its tail out, and then he's free to grow a bigger exoskeleton. They're pretty cool animals. We see horseshoe crabs in our seagrass beds a lot. Good. All right, the phylum that is the most hardest to say or pronounce, Echinodermata. This one is a really Really, really cool phylum. These guys have spiny skin. Two feet, like little suction cups, and pentaradial symmetry. So these guys have five equal parts, and they're really unique. So these are some examples of our echinoderms. Sea stars are very, very common out in our mangroves. Sea urchins as well. Sea biscuits, sea cucumbers, all of these guys have spiny skin, whether they're long and skinny spines or short, 
bond signs. You see these guys out there and they're honestly the coolest creatures to me. I didn't know much about econoderms before I came to the marine lab or before I started teaching marine science. Um, but they're very unique and they're kind of um, alien-like looking, especially this guy. This is a brittle star. He, instead of using his two feet to move ever so slowly, they can pull their whole arm to move their body. And these brittle stars are very nocturnal. They like to be hidden in the dark. So in order to find them, they have to, you usually have to look under big clumps of algae, like where this guy's headed, or under a rock. They really, really like the dark. They're really, really cool looking. And they can move a lot faster. What do we have next? Ah, our last phylum, you guys. This phylum has a large variety of animals in it, some that you're probably pretty familiar with. They all have a backbone. You can probably think of lots of things that have backbones. They have pharyngeal slits, just slits, um, gill slits, openings to their gills. And they have tails. Here you go, everyone. Lots of favorites. To me, seahorses are pretty neat. This is a dwarf seahorse. Look at how small it is. That's a turtle gra grass blade behind it. And then we have our barracuda. That's a small barracuda, juvenile barracuda. And then our green sea turtle. These guys hang out a lot in the seagrass beds because they eat seagrass. They're vigorous. Then we have dun, 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 the sharks. Good job, Michelle. Fish are in fine cordata as well. Oh no, what's happening? Sorry. Our new sharks hang out a lot in our seagrass beds at the coral reef. Under the mangroves, they are super cool. All sharks are super cool. Nurse sharks, I like to call them a little bit lazy because a lot of the times you're seeing them just sleeping at the bottom. They have the ability to breathe while sitting still so they can just take a nap whenever they want. They don't have to keep swimming. They're a pretty cool sight. A lot of times we see juvenile sharks in the seagrass beds as well. All right, everyone, the grand finale of our seagrass lesson. You stayed tuned in till now. You get to see our most favorite animal up close. So, so close. You don't normally get to see a manatee this close. Even though they seem slow, they can really kick it into gear and get away from you and boats if they want to. But here he comes. You get to see his beautiful, cute, cuddly face. Now, manatees are protected by the marine mammal act, so you can't touch them, and you really don't want to um, feed them or give them fresh water, because then they get used to being around people and boats, and that can be dangerous for them, especially being near boats. A lot of times you'll see pop scars on their backs. This guy has a lot of algae growing on his back, but most manatees we see Almost all have pop stars on their back from being hit by boats. A lot of people like to feed them fresh water because they have to go out and seek fresh water in order to get it. So a lot of people like to give them fresh water. All right, guys, that concludes our seagrass lesson. I'm so, so happy that you guys all tuned in and got to see our little seagrass lesson. Um, you guys can throw any questions that you still have in the comments if you'd like. I'll wait around for those, answer them. If you liked this lesson, you can follow our page and like us and you'll get notifications about the next lesson that we're doing. Um, and we also have a link in our description for our virtual site that's going to have all of our virtual lessons and the materials to follow along so that you can 
learn a little bit, have that worksheet so you can prove to your teacher that you did something. <laughs> That's great, Sierra. I had fun too. I really am missing teaching. I'm missing all the students that are here. At, are usually here at Marine Lab. We'll have some more lessons coming up for you guys, so stay tuned to our Facebook page for some new lessons in the future, and then um, get that, visit that virtual site that we have in our description, so you can check out some things we've done in the past. We did a coral class, and we also did invertebrate diversity lab. That was a fun class. You're welcome, Dylan. Thanks for tuning in. Oh, Shannon, that's too bad. We're missing all of our people in the keys. It's very empty down here. But I'm really glad everyone's staying safe and healthy. We will see you guys next time. This video will be available on YouTube and on our virtual site. If you guys have anyone that you know that couldn't watch it or uh, doesn't have Facebook. Lawrence says, what is the most endangered species living in the seahouse? Hmm, the most endangered species? Well, manatees were um, on the endangered list. They've recently been moved to threatened, so their populations are doing better. Um, sea turtle, green sea turtles are in our, living in our seagrass beds. They are um, a nurture of their um, endangered status, but I know that sea turtles in general are threatened. The most, I'm not sure of the most, but I'm trying to think. I would say manatees or sea turtles. A lot of our invertebrates are very, um, very their, their populations are doing well. So we see a lot of sea stars, urchins, lots of, our sponges came back since the hurricane, so they're doing well. That's a really good question, right? Oh, Shannon, you're from Ohio, that's awesome. I'm from Wisconsin, so we're sort of neighbors. Oh, Anne says sawfish endangered maurice that's a good one and sawfish i didn't think of those guys because we hardly ever see them so they are pretty endangered all right goodbye everyone visit our virtual page follow us on facebook